y'all guess what I'm going to preach on today? Redemption. Redemption. <laughs> All right, turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 13. Actually, I want to do some studies next few weeks on uh, three subjects that uh, have to do with our standing before the Lord, and that is redemption, justification, and sanctification. Uh, I've heard messages over the years on these subjects and uh, some very good messages, but I want us to look at some things and some details about these specific statements. Uh, for example, when Paul says being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. And all of these things have to do with not something we earn, not something we gain by our performance, but obviously uh, by trusting the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the justification and redemption are very closely tied to one another. Uh, and that's why I wanted to start out in Acts chapter 13. This is the first recorded message of the Apostle Paul. Uh, before we read there, let me say a welcome to those that have joined us over the internet. The last few weeks we've had a really good number on there. and I appreciate people tuning in. I appreciate people contacting us. Uh, and it's a real blessing to be on the internet. And we're on Facebook Live as well as uh, our website, understandingyourbible.com. I repeat this often, but we have new people most every week. Uh, we have a website, and on that website there are 10 years of messages, along with 36 TV programs. And so if you want to go back and listen to any old messages, uh, they're there for you to listen to. Uh, that's understanding your Bible, typed out all one word, dot com. All right, in Acts chapter 13, in verse 38, after this lengthy message that Paul has delivered in the synagogue, uh, if you look back in verse 14, it said, When they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Sidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down, and after the reading of the law of the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if you have any word of exultation for the people, say on. And I've always said that when I read that verse, I have the feeling that those men regretted that for the rest of their life. Because the next verse says, Then Paul stood up, uh, I did a message years ago and it was simply titled When Paul Stood Up because in this first recorded message this is not his first message obviously but the Lord saw fit to place this in the scripture and the Lord and Paul stood up and he spoke and through preachers and teachers he's been speaking now for 2,000 years and it is not his words that we follow. It are, it's the words of the Lord Jesus Christ through the Apostle Paul. And so Paul stood up and beckoned with his hand and said, Men of Israel and ye that fear God, give audience. And then Paul talks about the nation Israel and uh, how that they wanted to be under kings. He mentions David. He mentions uh, John the Baptist. He mentions the coming of Christ. And then he concludes down in verse 38 when he says, Be it known unto you, therefore men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. That was the, that was the theme of the... In other words, that was the idea that was being presented there to a people that believed that forgiveness of sins came through the keeping of the law, Paul is basically shattering that belief by the next statement. Because he says in verse 39, And by him all that believe, all that believe. Now, that would, again, 
kind of throw a monkey wrench in the theology of the Jews in the synagogue because they believed that salvation was of the Jews, as stated in John chapter 4. They believed that they were going to be the ones that were going to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature baptized and those that believe. They believed that God was going to bring a kingdom upon the earth through the nation Israel and through that nation would all nations of the earth be blessed. And yet Paul says, by him, the Lord Jesus Christ, all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. And that speaks to the fact that under the law of Moses, there were several sins that when they were committed, the penalty was death. Blasphemy was one of those. Adultery was another. And so today over in the Middle East, you have religions that still practice in some shape, form, or fashion the idea of immediate punishment. There was a man here in the United States that killed his daughter because of her disobedience to the uh, Islam religion. And in his defense at court, that was his defense. And he found out that didn't play well in America. And so he spent the rest of his life in prison. But the fact is, there were sins under the law that brought swift and immediate judgment. And Paul says, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, through the Lord Jesus Christ, is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe, are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Now that tells us something. That tells us that a person is not justified until they believe. You see, sometimes people that, that preach that forgiveness for the world's sins took place at Calvary, they're accused of saying that everybody is saved. Well, that's not true. I don't teach that. I don't know any other preachers that teach that. Well, I do know two preachers that preach that all, everybody in the world is going to be saved eventually. Universal salvation. But Paul makes it clear that belief is absolutely necessary. He said in Romans 1.16, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Nobody in this dispensation gets saved without believing the gospel. And the simplicity of that gospel is that Christ died for our sins, according to scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now, you'll remember that over in the book of James, we studied last year sometime, in James 2.24, he concluded, he said a man is justified by, uh, he concluded the man is justified by works and not by faith only. Well, that book was written to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. And it conflicts with what the Apostle Paul said about uh, this justification. So I want us to notice the first thing that was necessary for justification was redemption. Redemption. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. And redemption really started out in the Bible as an Old Testament doctrine. And there were all, any number of things that were redeemed. Uh, in the Old Testament. Let's look back there and just notice a couple of illustrations. Look in Leviticus chapter 25. In Leviticus 25, 
Look there in verse 23. Uh, these are laws concerning the year of Jubilee. Uh, if, if you start, if we go back to verse 8, you'll see that every 15th year was a year of Jubilee during which there was to be no sowing or reaping and during which all land was returned to its original owner and slaves to their families. Land that had been loaned out or whatever. So in the verse 8 it says, And thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years, and the space of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years. Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound, on the tenth day of the month, in the day of atonement, shall you make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. Now, I'm not going to take time to read all that, but notice what he says in verse 23. The land shall not be sold forever, for the land is mine, for you are strangers and sojourners with me. And in all the land of your possession you shall grant a redemption for the land. Redemption has to do with Purchasing something, buying something, uh, like we are purchased with his own blood, the Bible says. If you look down there in verse 51, verse 51, if there be yet many years behind, according to them, he shall give again the price of his redemption, he's talking about slaves, out of the money that he was bought for. Uh, if you look in verse 52, and if there remain but few years unto the year of Jubilee, then he shall count with him, and according to his years shall he give him again the price of his redemption. Here again, it just demonstrates what we talk about all the time, sometimes in just discussions, but we talk about how complex and complicated the law of Moses was. I mean, laws governing everything. The use of land, the use of animals, the use of slavery, slaves and servants, and all this kind of stuff. And it is an interesting thing that that redemption that was re used in relation to things and land and money and so forth, Paul used in relation to our salvation. Why? Because the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says, bought us with his own blood. Paul said, you are not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are his. I get fascinated at people talking about their self. Now, I know a saved person is not belong to the Lord in the sense of being saved. But even saved people sometimes take the attitude that our life is our own and what we do with it is our own business and on and on it goes. But the fact is, is that God Almighty has given us some instructions in relation to how we live day by day. And he said, you've been bought with a price the redemptive payment was the blood of Jesus Christ. And so, in, look over in Psalms chapter 130. In Psalms 130. I got up here last Sunday and uh, didn't have my watch on and uh, looked up and that clock was blank. All uh, the batteries were dead in it. Well, Mark made sure he got it fixed up <laughs> this morning, and I appreciate that. Psalms 130, uh, verse 7. Let Israel hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenteous Redemption. 
and he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. He shall redeem Israel from what? all his iniquities. The Old Testament redemption. Look in chapter 111 of Psalms. In Psalms 111, look at verse 6. He has showed his people the power of his works, that he may give them the heritage of the heathen. The works of his hands are verity and judgment. All his commandments are sure. They stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and uprightness. Now notice he sent redemption unto his people. He hath commanded his covenant forever. Holy and reverend is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. His praise endureth forever. By the way, Psalms 111 verse 9 tells you why no preacher should be referred to as reverend. He said redemption unto his people. He's commanded his covenant forever. His holy, holy and reverend is his name. His name. I was at a funeral home not long ago and they were writing up the obituary and they asked me if I wanted to read over it. The family had kind of giving their approval to it and when I got down to there who was conducting the service it said Reverend Steve Atwood and I looked at the guy and I said I don't know who that fellow is they said well that's you I said well then you need to remove the word Reverend he said well what are you talking about I said the Bible says that Reverend is the name of the Lord and I ain't the Lord <sighs> He took a deep breath. He said, what do you want to be called? I said, just put pastor, brother, whatever. And he just, he, he seemed exasperated with the fact that I didn't want to be called reverend. Well, I'm not. <laughs> I'm the furthest thing from reverend. Uh, I mean, ask Mary. Uh, <laughs> the point is, there in verse Ten, the fear of our, our the uh, verse nine. He sent redemption unto his people. And the reason I'm going through all this, folks, is a lot of times people get the idea that you know we we put Paul's letters in a capsule, and to go outside of that is some kind of uh, heresy or some kind of misuse of the scriptures. Much of what Paul taught in his books that he wrote, refers back to Old Testament doctrines and uses them uh, in relation to grace. And uh, if, you, if you just, you can go online and do that. I've got a document at home of every verse that Paul quoted from the Old Testament. It's well over 100. People say, well, why did he do that? Because all scriptures give them the inspiration of God. It's all God's word. And Paul will take a verse, like we were talking about the sinfulness of man. I believe it was Psalms 51 we were reading. And in there, Paul basically repeats it word for word in Romans chapter 3. And it has to do for by one man sin in the world. I mean, there's so many universal truths. And when it comes to redemption... Paul is talking to people there in the synagogue. They understand redemption. And they understand what it is to be redeemed. They understand what it was to be redeemed by the blood. But the lamb they believed they were redeemed by was the lamb that was brought by them. Think about Israel there when God told them to take a lamb and to kill that lamb and to put luck put the blood over the doorpost. They were redeemed. They were saved from 
the punishment that he had said was going to happen to the nation Israel. And that blood, when they saw the blood, they passed over that house. Thus, the Passover. And on and on it goes. And Paul uses those things in relation to us as members of the body of Christ. Uh, look, if you will, in 1 Corinthians. Well, just, just, let's go to, first of all, Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. I quoted this verse a moment ago. That verse I was talking about uh, that Paul quoted is Romans 3.10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. You'll find that in Psalms 53, 1 through 4. And he goes on down to verse 21, or verse 20. And... Somebody's got a mouth. Uh, <laughs> Romans 3, verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in the sight, for the, by the law is the knowledge of sin. You know what? With this technical stuff, you don't ever know what you're going to get. I woke up the other morning, and usually I try to slip out of the bedroom real quietly and close the door so Mary can sleep a little later because I get up usually around 6, 6.30. And when I stepped outside the bedroom door, there was a newscast playing so loud that I could hear it word for word. All, and it was in the other part of the house. And so I thought, well, Mary must have got up during the night and turned on the TV. And so I looked in there, and of course it's still kind of dark outside, and there was no light coming from the TV. Walked in there, the TV wasn't even on. But we have one of these little Alexa things. And I never told it to play the news. You know, we'll tell, set a timer or ask a question. That thing was blaring full blast ahead playing some kind of newscast. And I don't even know what it's talking about because I was too sleepy. And I said, shut up, Alexa. Well, you gotta give, you got to say Alexa first, you know. And I was just about ready to pick that thing up, throw it against the wall. You just don't ever know what you're going to get with this technology. Romans chapter 3, verse 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. You know, that's a wonderful verse. But now, you see, the righteousness of God had been manifested throughout the Bible in his dealings with the nation of Israel and how he was merciful to them and so forth and provided for them a blood sacrifice through the lamb and the, the offerings that were to be brought. But Paul says now, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Now you know that didn't set well with the Jews. But in verse 22 he says, even the righteousness of God I'm sorry, yeah, even the righteous of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace. Now next week we're going to talk about that justification. But notice what brought about that justification. He said, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. In other words, we couldn't be justified by His grace if we weren't first redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ. So he says in verse 25, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded by what law? Of works? Nay, by the law of faith. Therefore, 
we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. Now, you think about this. I remember very distinctly somebody last Sunday, we were having lunch, and they asked me about how I came to understand the grace message. And I said, well, the short answer is, is I came to believe the Bible. <laughs> and I said, because when you read through the Bible, unless you're just completely hard-headed and are going to ignore it, you cannot, you cannot come to the conclusion that there are, uh, aren't differences because there are differences. And, of course, there was then people that helped me and taught me and so forth. But the fact is, is that this chapter 3 alone starts out there in verse 21 with but now. But now. Something's changed. You know what that word, but how that about now is? It's like it was this way, but now it's this way. This was a Baptist church, but now it's a Bible church. Why? Because something took place in a physical sense. So Paul says, now, in the dispensation which we're living, the righteousness of God is manifested without the law. And it's by the faith of Jesus Christ. Look, if you will, over in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the blood. Now notice the next statement. In whom we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. So if you break the verse down and look at it, he says, number one, we have redemption. How is that? Through the killing of an animal? No. By going to church? No. In whom we have redemption? How? Through his blood. When Jesus Christ hung on that cross, his blood was poured out. His hands were nailed to that cross and he bled. They put a crown of thorns upon his forehead. And then at the very end, they took a spear and thrust it into his side. And what came out? Blood and water gushed forth. That blood being spilt, no doubt, is what Paul is referring to when he says, we have redemption through his blood. You see, under the Old Testament system of bringing sacrifices, Jesus Christ replaced all that by becoming a sacrifice himself. He gave himself for us. He loved us and gave himself. Matter of fact, right here in Ephesians, if you look over in uh, Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ all so loved the church, and gave himself. He gave himself for it. He offered himself up as a sacrifice. And he didn't 
particularly want to do that in his manly being. Say, so what do you mean? Well, all you got to do is read the book of Matthew over around Matthew 26. Jesus Christ is in the garden. He asked his disciples to tarry with him there for a while. You know what the disciples did? They fell asleep. Here Jesus Christ is agonizing. And what he's agonizing over is the cup that he looked into. And he sees those bowls of wrath in there. And he prays to God the Father. Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And so he's taken out from there. He is mocked. He's spit upon. He's stripped naked before the matzes. He's beaten with a cat of nine tails. His back becomes a, like bloody ribbons. And then he's taken and put on a cross. You see, when they killed a lamb, it wasn't the idea of punishing it. It was simply killed and the blood was spilled and caught and offered it to cover the altar so that when God looked down, he didn't see the sins of the people. He saw that blood. Like when he passed through the... I mentioned a moment ago. And so Paul says he ha in how we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Look over in Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. In Colossians chapter 1. In verse, let's just start at verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to His glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. You see, a filthy, rotten individual like us could never occupy heaven, so God made us meet. He made us everything we were needed to be made in order to be inherit, have an inheritance in the heavens. Verse 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Now, if you've got any other Bible other than the King James Bible, it will read, In whom we have redemption, even the forgiveness of sins. They leave out the phrase, through his blood. I remember years ago when I was a young man, there was a lot said about Christianity being a bloody religion. And the Methodist Church, United Methodist Church at that time, went through and they took the word blood out of all their song books. The Southern Baptists printed a Bible, the Good News for Modern Man. They took the word blood completely out of that Bible. There wasn't a single reference to blood in there. And yet the Bible says we have redemption through his blood. It wasn't just his death. As a matter of fact, the first time I ever really noticed that verse, many of you have heard me share this before, I was driving along and John MacArthur was preaching on Moody Radio and he read that verse. And when he read it, he read, In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. I thought, he must have, the radio must have cut out. And so he read it again. And then we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And so I had my Bible laying there in the seat. And so I pulled over. 
I used to just take it and lay it on the steering wheel, but that got, got, got to be a little dangerous. <laughs> but uh, when you're out in West Tennessee on a two-lane highway, you can do that. But anyway, I pulled over and I turned in my Bible, Colossians 1, 13. I was pretty young at this time. And I said, I can't believe that. And so as soon as I got back, got home, I began to, we had several Bibles there that for reference, and I looked in one of them, and the blood was gone. It was gone. And later, I heard John MacArthur questioned about that verse, and I was dumbfounded by his answer. This was on the radio too. He said, it's not the blood of Christ that saves us. It's faith in his death. It's not the blood. Now this is a man that had a minute, has a ministry and it's got the name Grace tied to it. And the man's very intelligent. I think, didn't you play one of his videos, Mark, when you were doing a lesson back there? He was talking about dispensationalism and so forth. And the man knows a lot of truth. And I'm not saying he's not saved or anything like that. All I'm saying is, is to deny the fact that we are redeemed by his blood is a very dangerous doctrine and it's an error. He said we're redeemed through his life and so that's why his theology is all messed up. Years ago, and this isn't meant just to be a critique of John MacArthur. Well, I guess it is. But he wrote a book, The Gospel According to Jesus. And he took the stance that a person today is not really saved until they're fully committed to the Lord. And so when I heard him preach that, I wrote Moody Radio here in Chattanooga. And I asked him, I said, do you believe Moody would have agreed with that statement? And I got no response. And so I wrote him again. I said, how can you have a man denying salvation by grace through faith and play him on the radio station? Because I'd call the radio station and they said I wasn't eligible to be on. I wasn't famous enough. And only, they only had nationally known preachers on there. So I didn't get a response from that, so I wrote directly to the Moody Bible Institute. I never got a single response from any of them. Folks, people just overlook these things and they make an awful big difference. We are redeemed by His blood. He shed His blood. Look back in Acts chapter 20. In Acts chapter 20. By the way, one of the questions the man asked him when he was being questioned on this doctrine about discipleship and you became, uh, when you became a disciple of Christ, you had to be fully committed. And he said this stuff about people getting saved and then continuing to live in sin, not having any fruit, he said that's just uh, an excuse to live a life like they want to. And so a fellow said, well, if salvation is when you are fully committed, how would you ever know when you fully were? And he never could answer the question. He danced all around it. And it's like, well, you'll know. Folks, aren't you glad to know that your salvation is based on the fact that Jesus Christ died for you? Amen. Isn't it good to know that you don't have to wonder or worry or question and you step out of the line and you don't have to run to 1 John 1, 9 and confess your sins and all that kind of stuff. Isn't it wonderful just to be able to rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ knowing His blood paid for all of our sins? That's a wonderful thing. The Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 20 is fixing to depart from Ephesus. And he is uh, he's sad about that because he loves these people at Ephesus and he, he says there, uh, in verse 25 and now behold I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God 
shall see my face no more. Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. He purchased us, folks. I mean, how much clearer could it be? For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, and draw away disciples after them. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. The Apostle Paul makes it clear that it was through the blood of Jesus Christ, and he says that he purchased us with his own blood. Look over again to Romans, this time Romans chapter 5. Romans 5. In Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Now notice, for when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now notice, this verse right here will just discard everything that John MacArthur said about the blood. Much more then, much more. He says, he commended his love toward us in that he died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Folks, apart from the blood of Jesus Christ, there is no salvation. Period. We've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. John said, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And Jesus Christ was that Lamb. And He will match up with the qualifications needed for a Lamb back in Exodus chapter 12. It was to be a male. He was to be without blemish. He was to be killed in the evening. And the blood was to be taken, sprinkled. I mean, on and on it goes. He is the Lamb of God. And for us, when He shed His blood, He shed that blood and it was payment for our sin so that all that believe are justified from all things from which you cannot be justified by the law of Moses. Folks, you can't work enough, you can't give enough, you can't do enough to compare with the sacrifice and the payment that Jesus Christ made for our sins at Calvary. By His blood, we are redeemed. By His blood, we are justified. Next week, we'll look at that doctrine of justification. And I think we'll be, it'll be interesting to see that it's not exactly what I was heard for many years. I used to hear people say justification is to be presented just as though you never sinned. Well, it goes a little bit 
deeper than that. And we'll look at that next week. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, folks, listen, it's, it's so simple. It, it is so simple. One other verse before we close quickly. Look in Hebrews chapter 9. I'm sorry I fooled y'all. Everybody was ready to jump up and run. Hebrews chapter 9. Look in verse 12. Or verse 11. But Christ, being come a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of bull of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood, listen now, if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling with the unclean, sanctified, purified flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Would you join me in prayer? Our Father, we thank you this morning for your shed blood. We thank you for redemption. And we thank you that we know that we are redeemed not because of anything we've done, but because you died for us at Calvary. And we pray that you'd help us to understand and realize that we have been bought. And that we've been bought with a price, and that price was your own blood. If there's anybody listening that's never been saved, I pray that they trust you today. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for being here today. We're dismissed.